The poor, are you kidding me? We're to reach out to the poor? There's not, not even any poor in this community. What happened was is that this was just bombarding my thoughts and my mind. Constantly, day in and day out, I didn't know what to do. And I remember distinctly that I was standing in the shower and all of these thoughts were coming in my head and I just began shouting at God and saying, what do you want me to do? This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. We have no means to do any of this and I don't even understand what this means. And you know, it wasn't just the shower. I got out of the shower and got dressed and I'm walking through the house and throwing up my hands and just screaming out at God. I don't understand. This just makes absolutely no sense. God began um, speaking to me about the poor of our community in the winter. And I didn't know what to do with it because I really wasn't <clears throat> thinking that there was a lot of poverty. But I was so wrong. And through a fairly significant conversation with an individual, uh, I, began, I decided to pitch the idea to our congregation and see what they thought. Because at that point, we had no space that was our own. We had no tables, we had no chairs, we had no kitchen, we had nothing. That night I looked at my sister after he got done talk, Hank got done talking, I started asking him questions about where would we have it, what could we do, what are the legalities of it, and said, well, that's, we'd have to have somebody that could find all that out and start everything and basically be a director. And when we got done talking, I looked at my sister and she said, I think Hank's talking about you. And I said, there is no way I would be a director. I want to work at it. I want to serve. I'll cook. I'll do whatever they need, but there's no way I'm directing it. As I was leaving the building where we had had this conversation and people were pretty energized and pretty excited about the possibilities of this, I walked out and there was this, there was just like this old guy that was walking. He just walked around the corner and he had this, uh, limb to help him walk and as a cane and um, he had he was smelly and he had a bunch of long hair and it was all gray and uh, I mean it sounds crazy really that this guy just appeared out of nowhere and I had never seen him in my life and he popped up he walked right up to me and he was like hey what's going on in there and so I was telling him a little bit about just the congregation and that type of thing and just out of nowhere he began talking about God and he began sharing how that uh, in his life and in his history of his relationship with God that he had realized that if God called you to do something that you needed to step through and do it because he was faithful and that conversation lasted probably about seven minutes and and some of his parting shot words were you know what if God's called you to do something then you need to do it. He didn't know anything about what we had just had a conversation of. So I walked back in the building, and said so long, walked back in the building, and when I came out, I was in the building maybe two minutes, and he was gone. And I asked the people that were had all gathered there and watching, um, where'd he go? What happened? And they said, well, he walked around the corner of the building. We all walked there, and he disappeared was completely gone and we felt right at that moment that this was a, well we really felt like it was an angel that had come to encourage us to go forward with what we thought the dream was and I was driving around town trying to think of places to have this and uh, driving around driving around I finally said I've got to go stop at Hank's and tell him I'm gonna do it because I know God wants me to do it and I was smacking my car wheel going, why am I doing this? I don't want to do it. And I ended up coming up to his house and he was counseling someone at the time, said, hey, what do you need? I'm you know, kind of busy. And I started kicking the door frame of his house and saying, I'm so mad at God right now because I don't want to do this, but I know he's telling me to do it. And after that, then it kind of let up and I'm like, okay, this is what you've got me doing. Show me what I need to do. And then I had a meeting and it was a total random meeting with a lady that I had never met before in my life. 
and it was a phone conversation. And we were talking about a lot of other situations in the community. And I said to her, hey, let me just bend your ear a minute. Is there a real need in this community for this? She said, there is more of a need than you will ever know. And if you would begin to pursue this, you will meet the needs of people beyond the scope you would ever understand. All of those things added into how this all began. The confirmation to the sight of my eyes being opened to actually and completely stepping out in faith and starting the forklift. I went over and talked to Lucy, Hank's sister, about helping me because I knew that's who had to help me. I was so excited when we found out that Laura was wrestling with this and how God was working with her. And so it just seemed natural to saddle up next to her. And in talking to Mata Jean, Hank's mother, who has done a lot of cooking, um, I had been thinking of a lot of different places and she talked about a place in Michigan that she didn't want to cook anymore and this was the place that she finally said, okay, I'll cook one more season for you. I worked at the center. And when I said to her that I had worked at the center up in Michigan, it was a big retreat center. She said, the center, oh my, we have a center here. And I went, oh my gosh, the center. That's a perfect place. It's an old church. It's got to have a kitchen. And within a week, I had so many things thrown in front of me to be able, easy things, to get it done that it was really, I think, God getting me ready to just give it to Him. That if I trusted Him with it, it was going to happen. Miracles that have happened has just been the space that's been provided for us um, free. Shocking. We had to then revamp the entire kitchen because it had to become health code status and everything had to be changed. And the miracles that came through was not only were finances donated for this cause that hadn't even started yet, but also from restaurants, we were given not a three bay sink, but a four bay sink. And then refrigerators came in and then extra freezers came in. And miraculously, we were able to get this ridiculous deal on a commercial stove. And through all of that, we began uh, then the ministry of just initially setting up with this one night a week. And it was a year ago or in uh, January 2012 that we began feeding five nights a week. We feed Monday nights for anybody and everybody that is in need. We feed then Tuesdays through Thursdays for any student from sixth grade up through 20 years old where they can come in and get a hot meal. And the crazy thing is that people ask all the time, how are you guys paying for this food? Because we are serving over well over 200, sometimes 250 people a week. And honestly, our answer is it's God. In the very beginning, uh, we were working in here on a Monday, and a gentleman from the Catholic Church came in, and he said, do you guys need eggs? Would you want eggs? And we had just been talking about eggs and chicken, how we could do or what it would cost us to get. And he had both. I think we ended up with 80 dozen eggs, and I want to say it was over 100 pounds of chicken, and he gave it to us free. Volunteer-wise, I've never asked for a volunteer in over two years. We've always, It's been skimpy sometimes, but we always manage. Um, money just comes in. I think it comes from God. He puts it on people's heart, hearts. Um, I work at a hospital, and I've talked to several of the doctors about stuff I do. One doctor group has given us $4,000 just because we said, you know, I happened to mention something that we need. and. Uh, 
other churches. I mean, I think the neat thing about this, it isn't just the warehouse, it's Columbia City making this happen. And um, I mean, we have things that come from all over that I always say to Hank, I don't know how I let God still surprise me. But every time I turn around within the last week, God knocked me down and said, I told you it would happen. And it always does. Always does. There's quite a hubbub of, I feel, community. It's like a family. It's like we've all become a family and we're part of their family. I feel like these people are my family now. We're not here to judge anybody or to um, categorize anybody. We just are here that if we can help you out with a warm meal every week, that's what we really want to do. You went out of your way to get me a jacket that was just amazing. And then I come back the next week and you got another jacket for me. I just want to thank you so much. I, you know, I just don't know why I was so blessed to be able to get that gift. You know, it may not seem like a lot to a lot of people, but one meal can make a big difference in the week. We've made so many friendships and the way we've touched people and the way they've touched me. I think many times these people do more for me than I could ever do for them. Because the people, yep. you know, you got to interact with all the people. I've met a lot of nice people here, but Randy kept saying, why don't you just go one time, just go one time. So Jim picked me and Randy up, and that's from the first time I came here, and then I met Chloe. <laughs> so that really worked out great for me. Yeah, so then we were kind of a dating service. <laughs> <laughs> this was a cheap date. Yeah. And I just think it's a neat community driven thing and it's all done with love and it's all done for God. He brought it here. He's really the one that's controlled everything from the beginning. <laughs>